Reagan at Reykjavik. 48 hours that ended the Cold War. And your author, Ken Edelman, President Reagan's Arms Control Director from 83 through 87, including at Reykjavik, where he accompanied President Reagan three superpower summits and all also served U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Assistant Secretary of Defense, taught Shakespeare at Georgetown and George Washington, National Security at Johns Hopkins in Georgetown, and in the meanwhile, in his spare time, assuming there was some, he's written several books as well. Ken, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? We're doing very well. Boy, any more about you, we wouldn't have any time for this interview. I know. I thought it was kind of short. But, uh, <laughs> that's <not> right. <laughs> you could go on for 40 minutes. You know, I, I, I envy you so much the idea to have that kind of access at that sort of summit, to be sitting right there and seeing real history being made. Well, it's a great story. That's what's wonderful about it. And that's, uh, I took 27 years to think about it and tell people about the story and then decided to finally write it, and it's a great story because it's like an Agatha Christie mystery that there in an isolated spot in an old creaky house that was thought to be haunted with rain lashing against the windowsill, uh, two unbelievable characters spent a weekend and uh, came up with the most amazing things possible. Yeah, all you needed was a few people to die mysteriously. You do have an Agatha Christie novel. <laughs> yes, but not, no one did, thank God. But uh, they were talking about the most uh, critical issues of their time and our time on nuclear weapons and uh, superpower rivalry. And what it shows is an insight to the men because they were there talking for ten and a half hours without scripts, without notes, without staff interference, without memos. And you see Ronald Reagan raw. You see him, as his son Michael Reagan has said about the book, you see him in a way that the other book has seen him before. Ken, I think we have to set, set the scene a little bit as to what led up to this, this summit. Uh, as far as I know, what about 83 or so? There was virtually... It was October right, of 86. Right, this was October 86, but three years previous, there was no communication between the U.S. and the Soviet Union at all, at all basically. Every, everything well, was shut down, closed down. Yeah, the summit that uh, Gorbachev and Reagan had in Geneva the year before, in 85, was the first superpower summit in seven and a half years, the first for Reagan and the first for Gorbachev. So you're absolutely right. So this leads up to Reykjavik. What were the expectations of you, of the Reagan administration, heading into this, uh, this summit? The expectations were that this was going to be a glad-handing summit, that it was going to be grip and grin, and that Gorbachev needed to got to have a meeting with the President of the United States just to elevate his domestic standing. And so we didn't expect much at all about it and from it. And uh, all of a sudden, Gorbachev came with a uh, absolutely a briefcase full of proposals that he literally dumped on the negotiating table in, in Reykjavik, in that haunted house of the Hofti House. And from there on, the weekend was full of ups and downs, twists and turns, uh, depressions and elations, and it was uh, just a phenomenal co a roller coaster ride. Now, I, I guess one thing that should be noted too, when when, when we look at uh, you know all the polling information that you you look at on today's leaders, and you know what's their approval, what's their disapproval. Both of these guys were really pretty much at the zenith of their power, weren't they? Yes, they were at the zenith of their power, and Raisa Gorbachev, who was there with uh, her husband Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, Nancy Reagan was back in Washington, and Raisa Gorbachev was at the zenith of her power as well. And because there was a news blackout of the summit, and she was there, and the other first lady, Nancy Reagan, was not there, uh, she really used it as a great platform for the world. She went around and changed clothes four times the first day of the summit and raced around for various sites, of which uh, Reykjavik doesn't have that many. And with <laughs> How people, many times did you change clothes, Ken? Uh, I didn't change clothes. I don't think all, all <laughs> but I, I really, uh, <laughs> we were so exhausted. We did a all-night negotiations on Saturday night from 8 o'clock at night until 6.20 in the next morning. Ken Edelman with us, the book Reagan at Reykjavik, uh, 48 Hours That Ended the Cold War. You can find it linked up on our, our Twitter feed this morning. Now, you described in the book, you said you thought it would be glad-handing, just a photo-op kind, of kind of a summit. You describe Gorbachev and his, uh, his negotiator giving up concession after concession after concession and, and both sides being a, a bit confused about what was unfolding. Yeah, well, I don't know that if they were confused, it was... 
that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, was with Reagan. He was a generation younger than Reagan. Everybody said he was so much smarter than Reagan, so much more knowledgeable than Reagan. But over the ten and a half hours, he kept saying to Reagan, I'm making, I, Gorbachev, are making all the concessions, and you've given me nothing. And uh, Ronald Reagan, each time he said that, which is over ten times over those ten and a half hours, you know what Ronald Reagan said? He said nothing. He probably sat there thinking, what's wrong with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's just fine. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people I know who'd be proud of those kind of negotiating skills. Yeah, absolutely. And and Reagan thought of himself as a great negotiator. He had the experience of the Screen Actors Guild before that time. And uh, I venture to say that my book is the only book probably ever written that has a uh, entry in the appendix that says um, urinal diplomacy. <laughs> because uh, Reagan was very proud of his urinal dip- diplomacy. A whole story that I contained in the book. Outstanding. Another one, one of the reasons you're going to want to grab Reagan at Reykjavik. Ken Edelman is the author. What did, uh, what did Reagan think of Gorbachev personally? Uh, he thought that uh, he was a dedicated communist <laughs> and that, um, that he was a man he could do business with, as um, Maggie Thatcher said the year before. So there was a grudging uh, respect for him, but uh, an understanding that uh, all the things that Gorbachev believed in, Ronald Reagan had opposed most of his life. In, in the book, you've got, uh, you've got meeting notes taken by Gorbachev's aides as, as they got set for the summit. And apparently Gorbachev told his colleagues that if, if there were no agreement here, if there were no agreement between the two sides, that the USSR would be pulled into an arms race beyond our power and we will lose. So he certainly understood that the same thing Reagan understood, which was that the U.S. could could outspend the Soviet Union. They could take the arms race and, and basically cripple the, the Soviet Union by, by, by building the arms race. That's right, and uh, Gorbachev keeps saying that. We have the notes from the preparation meetings before Reykjavik, and Gorbachev keeps saying that. And that's what Reagan had been saying, uh, much to the mockery of the knowledgeable Washington <laughs> experts who said that that was preposterous. Uh, but the fact is that we now know from declassified documents that the situation was absolutely right, that the Soviets were spending at that time not 8 or 10 percent of GDP, on their military, which the CIA thought, but they were spending more than more like thirty percent or forty percent of their GDP. So they were off by a factor of three or four. Now uh, you, you mentioned it's still debated to this day whether or not Reykjavik played such a central role in ending the Cold War. And uh, you know the other one is has it has it even really ended given the standoff with Putin and the other things? I, I think you address that very well in the book. Well, thank you. I address that and say that my thesis is that the events that started at Reykjavik led to the end of the Cold War. And I challenge people to read that part and to say it's not true. (laughs) (laughs) Reagan at Reykjavik, that's the book. It's linked up on our Twitter feed this morning. Ken Edelman's the author. It's Riley and Scott here on WROK. I should Uh, mention one other thing. that There is a movie in the works about this. Uh, starring Michael Douglas as Ronald Reagan. He prides himself on being the only person to go from Liberace to Ronald Reagan. (laughs) He he called me a few weeks ago, and he's very excited. He said that he just absolutely loves the book, and that went on and on and on. So we had a long and good conversation. So that will be filmed next year. Got to ask, who plays Gorbachev? Uh, They're thinking of Christoph Waltz. Oh. Oh. You know, who won two Academy Awards, and uh, he's a great actor. Yeah, no slouch there. No great actor. So, so the summit, Ken, is, is obviously behind closed doors. The media is 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 there, but but they don't know what's happening. They don't know about the concessions. Oh, they don't know about the. Do back- there is follow Raiz or Gorbachev around town, <laughs> and her uh, shilly shallying uh, and changes of outfits. So, no, they they are having a news blackout. But but they, so uh, they have nothing to say. But at the end, though, they see Reagan, who, who's who's mad, who's upset. And, and, and Gorbachev, who seems resigned, parting the house where they, they had met. What, what do they take from that? They take that it was a failure, that uh, right, that um, Reykjavik was a big failure, that Ron Reagan ended mad, that there were no dates set for the next summit, that they had concluded nothing, et cetera, et cetera. By the next year, when the most sweeping arms control agreement to eliminate an entire class of nuclear weapons was signed in the White House, uh, Reykjavik became a very good success, and three years later, 
when the Soviet Union fell, it became the most important summit of the post-war period. Struck me, though, Ken, because I can remember reading some of these news accounts at the time where you, where you talked about that, you know, Reagan's mad and Gorbachev's run, this was a failure, and this, but, but, but it sure seemed, that, at least in the American media, that uh, many of them were, were, were lining up on the Gorbachev side of things. Oh, absolutely, but that was the, just the tenor of the times. Everybody thought that Reagan was kind of a dummy <laughs> and that uh, Gorbachev was so wonderful and so smart and so forward-thinking, and Ronald Reagan was mirrored or moored in the 1930s and stuck right there. Do you think that, uh, that Reagan really knew Gorbachev? Uh, Gorbachev? I mean, do you, do you think that he really understood what his intentions were, how he wanted to perhaps save the Soviet Union or at least move it toward the future? Was there an understanding on the president's part of, of what Mikhail Gorbachev was, was trying to accomplish? There was an amazing understanding of the way the world was uh, going to evolve, that Reagan had that the experts on Russia, the experts on the Soviet Union, the experts on Gorbachev really didn't have. For example, Ronald Reagan started saying in the 1970s that he knew how the Cold War was going to end. It was going to end, we win and they lose. And he was talking about the end of communism, ending up on the ash heap of history, that the Soviet Union was an evil empire, that it was the focus of evil in the modern world. All these things that uh, experts said were just foolish. But Ronald Reagan was right, and they were wrong. Ken, as, uh, as President Reagan's arms control director, and you're there at that summit, did uh, Gorbachev bring along your opposite number? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. How'd you guys get on? Well, there was ac um, that's an interesting story, too, that's told in the book. Marshal Akramayev, who's a five-star marshal, and he performed magnificently in the Hofti House at Reykjavik. He then went on, the most decorated man in Soviet history. Uh, he went on and in 1999, 1991 committed suicide in his office, hung himself on his chandelier in his office, which is right down the hall of, from Gorbachev's office. It's an amazing story, and it runs through uh, the book Reagan at Reykjavik. Wow. <laughs> that left me literally speechless. <laughs> I know. It, it is a phenomenal. It left us speechless as well. Wow. Ken Edelman with us just another minute or two. Uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars, was made fun of by, by, by many, thought it would be impossible, but the, the specter of it played a large role in the negotiation. That, that's what Gorbachev wanted Reagan to give up, to say, I, we won't go through with this, because he knew Soviet Union, uh, that he knew the Soviet Union could not, they couldn't keep up on the current arms race. If there was going to be an SDI, they'd be left to the dust. And so SDI played a large role in what happened at Reykjavik, yes? Yes, and what happened following Reykjavik, because after Reykjavik, uh, Gorbachev decided he wanted to reform the Soviet Union in a more major way than he had before. He started those reforms, and the system couldn't take those reforms, and that led to the decline and the end, the decline and collapse of the Soviet Union. Nothing better than a, a book about history written by someone who was sitting right there and someone who tells the story as well as Ken Edelman does. Reagan at Reykjavik, 48 hours that ended the Cold War. You, you're going to want to run, not walk, to go out and get this one. Ken, thanks a lot a for, for the time. Thanks for, a great story. thanks for the sense of humor with it as well. We <laughs> wish you a lot of success with the book. Well, thank you so much. It was a great interview.